previously on Carbal Collaborative Warfare. Triumphant Cthulian forces encasing the raw military might of the shredded panache hover tank liberate Ben Bay from the evil clutches of Chairman Agonarch's war machine. Dear ally and good friend Penguin, handicapped with a crippled flipper, begins colonization of the moon and captures unclaimed territory, Sanctuary Mouth. Evil terrorist Nazi war criminal tape captures John B. Kerman in an unrivaled display of viciousness, subjugates the residents of Twin Peaks to horrific imprisonment, continues to illegitimately claim either side as his land, and tests new horrific war machines at Cola Crater. <laughs> Chairman Agonarch once again shows his inflexibility in planning and strategy by attacking Ben Bay, an outpost to the east of Northern Clothu. Hey guys and welcome back to Kerbal Collaborative Warfare, the version of Cable, Kerbal Space Program where we have installed BD Armory, for you guessed it, weapons and Kerbin side for a great big lumber of bases to split up amongst ourselves and go to war over this planet. As previously seen on the scene previously, you all know that I have two troubled bases that I have to take care of. The first of course is Ben Bay, just down the road from Kerman Lake here. Uh, this has been a perennial battleground with... Agonarch, and to round off the uh, T Alliance, Tape has been trying to take hold of Cola Crater. He's just left the helicopter there, we'll talk about that at the time, but right now we're going to talk about Ben Bay and this uh, this place, Kerman Lake. To make full use of the breaded Galash, the newest vehicle that we have uh, deployed, we've had to move these wretched porcupines just a little bit. Uh, they would just happen to be sat in the middle of where I actually wanted to take the breaded Galash, so there we go. Uh, we're going to move around and turn everything to Team B, because I'm going to make an attack all the way from over here. One of the main things that I like about Cola Crater, uh, uh, no, sorry, not Cola Crater, Kerman Lake and Ben Bay, is the fact that they are within 30 kilometers of each other. Which means that if I really, really wanted to, I could test the waters with the Orb Weaver with a few cruise missiles. And so that is what I have done. Uh, we're going to send four over the first, after, sorry, the first Orb Weaver, or the Orb Weaver number five. Uh, this is mainly because it was the one that popped up when I double clicked on the, the mash of targets that that was over there. Uh, it turns out quite a lot of stuff at Ben Bay at the moment. We've got two orb weavers, there's an aeroplane, uh, the mosquito, and the destroyed remains of the shredded panache, our hover tanks that went through and saved the day last time. Uh, as they did so well, I thought we'd uh, step it up a notch, take the breaded galash, my new heavy weapons uh, moving hover tank weapons platform thing. Yeah, a lot of weapons because there are a lot of weapons on it. Uh, and opened up with a volley of cruise missiles. Now we're coming in about four or five kilometers away now and I'm wondering why we haven't had any return fire yet. Now I think this is due to the fact that the Orb Weaver seems to be very sort of plane orientated, sort of firing up. We're going to drop down to real speed for two reasons. One, so you guys can see the frames that we're dealing with. It's about three frames per second. But also we can have a blow-by-blow -blow analysis of how this, this hit goes down. Um, very well is my blow-by-blow -blow analysis there. More importantly, we should, uh, aside from watching the explosions, which is what I was doing at the time, notice in the background there, there's an engine that's just started up. Now, I didn't see this at the time. I, I had no idea that that was there. I was too busy watching things explode and going, Yeah, I can't believe it worked! Yeah! But there, there was a plane, started its engine, stopped its engine. I don't know. I, I, as I say, I didn't notice it at the time. Uh, if I did, I don't know what I would have done anyway. Maybe turned it round so that it could take off in another direction or something. I don't know, but uh, there we go. I just wanted to point out that that was going on. And we have had a successful hit against one of the Orb Weavers. Uh, so successful that I think we might actually go and try and do it again. The hardest part of actually being able to perform that manoeuvre all over again was actually trying to target the Orb Weaver, the second Orb Weaver. Uh, it was just huddled amongst the debris of its falling foe, fallen comrades and foes, because indeed there was some debris from the shredded panache just still strewn about the floor around Ben Bay. Whether this is part of uh, Agonarch's continuing terror plan to try and inspire fear in the local populace, whether it was supposed to just try and make it hard for me to... Uh, target his vehicles, I don't know, but they definitely achieved both those aims. So at this point I'm like, I've got this in the bag. The last one exploded without any thought. This one is also going to go down with, oh no, what are those clouds of smoke coming off the Orb Weaver? What do you mean this one had countermeasures? 
so none of those cruise missiles actually ended up hitting the other thing we've got to take care of is this plane has taken off now I will know, and I'm, I'm pretty sure you guys will as well, there appears to be the front end missing of this plane. Now, I didn't get a good look at this uh, in the satellite imagery. I just kind of took note that it was a plane and then ignored it because, you know, no one actually makes use of their planes properly. But there appears to be a lot missing from this mosquito now. Uh, I, I don't know what happened. I literally I have no idea. Uh, I spotted it going up whilst the second batch of cruise missiles were going in. There was just this pink thing going off at a 45 degree angle. So I was like, well, we'll, we'll go and find out what that was. Turned out it was this. Uh, and now we're going to try and land it. I say try and land it because it's got no tailplane, next to no engine control, uh, and I just couldn't get it to pitch up. So I hit the parachutes that I noticed were on here and then realised they were on the underside of the plane. Agonarch, what are you doing? Why why would you put a parachute on the other side? Uh, I, yeah, I don't, I, I'm, I'm confused. I am very confused. With the taste of crushing disappointment fresh in my mouth, it's time to take the bread and galash and get it off of this base. We need to get up over the top of that crater, which, believe me, was not as easy as it sounds, and then get down the other side, which, once again is not as easy as it sounds, make our way all the way to the coastline, put it down and go, you know what, that was a lot of driving, I'm going to take a little break here, let's get over to Black Crags. Black Crags, scene of the beginnings of so much devastation against tape, has begun a new chapter in its story today. The Bread of Galas was an experimentation into the use of fear via big weaponry, this is all about how small a helicopter I can build. You will see in the background there we've got the uh, wasted porcupines. They were tiny, tiny little vessels that got thrown off the back of another vessel as I was flying by. This helicopter is not much bigger than them themselves. So, you know, I think we did quite well for the given size of package. This vessel was developed with one aim and one aim only in mind. That is to make its way all the way over to Cola Crater, blow up Tape's helicopter and then sit there going, ah, what are you going to do about it? Of course, what you can do about it is quite obvious. Like you send in anything with any sort of missile capabilities or even a jet plane that can dodge like, I don't know, anything. And then you are far outclassing any helicopter there. I was going to make this a bit more of a heavy hitter. Uh, indeed, I was going to stick a cruise missile on the bottom of it. But as you can see from this particular shot here, there would not have been any room. So what I've stuck with is a couple of uh, Hellfires, a howitzer on the front, and some chain guns all around the outside just to, you know, defend against any incoming missiles that might actually be around. Uh, I don't think we're going to have too much issues with missiles. Well, not... Not ones that we can actually stop. If we have an issue with missiles, then we are done for, basically, because helicopters, rubbish. Totally, totally rubbish. But, given how rubbish helicopters are, I have a proposition for tape and any other interested parties that are out there. So, obviously, I'm on my way to take over Cola Crater with just a helicopter. I propose that we make Cola Crater the helicopter battleground, at least between me and you, tape. Uh, if it's all right with you, or if you, you know, want to partake in this without like just storming all over the obvious defective machine come at me with another helicopter and by a helicopter i think the, re the uh, restriction we should put on is anything we can fit underneath a single main rotor obviously we're going to need a stabilizing stabilizing one on the back but if you can lift with a single rotor we will call that a helicopter stick whatever you want underneath it bring what you can to this battle with that i will do the same and we're going to have good old helicopter wars you know if you're up for that so with that challenge laid down, we're going to drop down into about double speed here. Um, we're always going to be at time acceleration for anything to do with helicopters because, oh wow, it was slow. It was it, like majorly slow. You can see up my surface readout above my nav ball there. We were topping out at 100 meters per second and that was when we were diving through the air. Like whenever we were trying to go for level flight, I think the maximum I got was about 79 meters per second. So let's call it 80 given the fact that I was traveling hundreds of kilometers, maybe even 200 kilometers, uh, it was quite a, a flight. You know, no, nothing too uh, unbearable, but it was still quite a flight. Right, so we're about to come up over the top of this hill here, and I feel a little bit bad for, for Tape's helicopter there. I do happen to know that it is almost um, completely 
defenseless. If I flew right in front of it, I think it could have a go at me. It had a, a Vulcan cannon underneath. But I'm coming in at a 45 degree uh, angle, and as you can see, the howitzer made very, very short work of his actual uh, helicopter there. So, yay us! We managed to do very well. Uh, uh, the other thing I wish to point out with this helicopter is it's almost... No, there is no always. It is entirely electrically powered. You can see we've got the uh, the fuel cells left and right on my on my vehicle there. Uh, that that was great. It, it really did me well. I, I'm not sure whether it extended my my range or not. I hadn't tried this with the the liquid fuel only propellers to know, but there we go. Electric powered helicopter people. I love it. Called it the Wasp. It's got a bit of a sting in the tail. Of course, the base is not yours until you like put up your own flag. Uh, one thing I do want to point out that I didn't point out during the sped up footage was the way that Tape's flag just disappeared from my screen. I'm used to them like jumping up to like 10 or 20 kilometers away, but no, Tape's flag just utterly disappeared whilst I was moving in for the kill. So who knows? You can see in the background there is my old flag. I could have just left that there, but I was like, no, nah, you know what? We, we need a new flag. So we're going to place it down. Of course, we are going to name it after the place that we are. Uh, yeah, that, that made sense. We're going to name the flag after Cola Crater, the location, the base that we are located at. And of course, we're going to put the nation's initials beforehand. And not only are we going to say that where we are, we're going to tell the world via the medium of the plaque that yes, their leader is the owner of this place and his are the rightful hands to own it. Come at me, bro. Welcome back to Cthulhu State TV. Now we have a special report on how Dear Leader spends his downtime, when he has finished saving all the Cthulians from the encroaching threat of the invading tea army. He is the living embodiment of a god, but that doesn't mean Dear Leader Twitch Young E does not like to relax and have a good time with his many, many friends. Whether he is flying classic planes, enjoying the high-tech thrills of a jet ski, or facing off against the toughest peaks that Kerbin has to offer, Dear Leader conquers all his hobbies with the same grit and determination and style he brings to the international political table. Truly all citizens are blessed to have such as him as a great leader. Glory! After the resounding victory at Cola Crater, it's time to come over to the Bread of Kalash and get this thing in the water because we need to head a long way over to Ben Bay and take care of Agonarch. Or at least the Orb Weaver that is left. We've taken two out of the three vehicles that were there out of commission. Now, I say we've taken, we took one out of the three out. One of the other ones managed to spontaneously make itself into a useless vessel. And now we have an Orb Weaver to deal with. We're going to follow the same profile that the Shredded Panache on our last turn took. We're going to fly out, we're going to zip past just outside its range and uh, try and come in for a covered entry. Ben Bay is of course a harbour, meaning that the water right in front of it is surrounded by hills on all sides. So if we come out here at the right angle, we can stay hidden behind the terrain. Uh, to, to get nice and close so that we don't actually have to take a direct hit from the Orb Weaver at any time because the Orb Weaver is by far the most terrifying thing on the planet at the moment. I think so anyway, at least when we're trying to go and attack. I, I was having a look at other people's defences. I was fairly sure I could do stuff against those. I mean, but right now we have an incoming interceptor missile. We didn't manage to get across completely unscathed, but that's all right. With a, a few countermeasures, we managed to take care of everything. As I was saying, the Orb Weaver is probably the only one out there that is innovating every turn. So far, every time Agonarch has taken over one of my bases, I have indeed found at least a weak weakness in the Orb Weaver's defences, but that every one of those weaknesses has been closed to me by the next turn. I've had to go out and find a, a new tactic. Thankfully, this tactic of getting within five kilometres before I start launching missiles seems to be almost a universal panacea. Coming in and making their destructive blows before the Orb Weaver actually has chance to be able to target onto them uh, and do something about it. Obviously, given the time, the, the Orb Weaver totally will take down even the biggest missile swarms. And to prove my point right there, I think what we're going to do is launch this Hellfire Swarm that I have mounted on the front here. They are clustered too close together to fire off using the automatic firing system. Uh, it took me a little while to notice here that I didn't actually have the Orb Weaver targeted after about the second or third missile launch there. So that, that was a little bit embarrassing. But, you know, I'm going to leave this stuff in because you guys like to watch all this stuff. Uh, there are roughly, I'm going to say, 24 missiles on the go here. There's 12 on each side. Uh, we're going to fire a few interceptors and stuff. We use the, the helmet fires to 
uh, confuse the Orb Weaver, and then hopefully the Interceptors are going to go in and do the actual like punch damage and do a whole load of whole load of uh, problems there for him. Uh, as you can see, the hail of bullets coming up is something quite spectacular, and the countermeasure use absolutely sublime. I, I I really don't know how I can get through this this, this shield here. But we're going to continue trying, and out of sheer desperation, we're just going to fire off all the Hellfires. I mean, this was really the only chance that the Hellfires had of making any damage in there. We can't get close enough. We can't get any closer and fire these and still be effective. Mainly because if we come out from behind this hill, we are dead. The, the Orb Weaver will fire all sorts of stuff at us, and then, then it's just... It's all over then. If the Orb Weaver gets a clear shot at us, this, this thing is just not manoeuvrable enough, not even close. Now with all that talk of not wanting to go closer or anything like that underway, uh, I have just completely run out of missiles and there are now intercept missiles coming back at me. I am worried at this point. I've run out of all my really super long range ways of getting, getting in there and having a pop at him. Uh, the bullets are flying, the intercept missiles are thankfully clearing over my head and with absolutely nothing left to do I think that I'm going to have to go round the hill and go take on the Orb Weaver. It's literally the only thing left to me at the moment. Every weapon that you see left on me at this present moment in time was not meant for attack. Uh, the Goalkeeper, the Chain Cannons, the Interceptor Missiles, all these were supposed to be for defensive purposes. I was supposed to have completely annihilated all the Orb Weavers at this point. At least that's how the plan in my head had worked. And I find myself in a very desperate state, having to take this hulking piece of machinery out into exposed fire do my best to try and just deflect whatever comes my way and then try and use the goalkeeper to shoot at it that that's my plan at the moment uh, i don't feel great about that plan and for some reason i can't get my goalkeeper to turn in any other direction uh, i'm pointed at the, the orb weaver that's great but that's not what i want to do i want to be trying, trying to take down these missiles that are coming for me uh, I am scared at this point. Nothing seems to be working. In fact, there is even an explosion. I'm terrified. What exploded? What happened? How did things go wrong here? Uh, as it happens, nothing actually went wrong. If you, if you look at the back of my ship, I have three engines on the left and four on the right. Yeah, that's right. The only thing that intercept missile did to me was take out one of my engines on the left. Which is actually pretty good for me due to the way that this vessel was put together. This is actually a reimagining of the dreaded Ganache, uh, a vehicle that I used to take over the KSC Island uh, three episodes ago, two episodes ago, something like that. Now, the, that vehicle was amazing, but it did have a little bit of a problem that it didn't actually have enough power to power all the anti-grav motors on it. And given that this vehicle is exactly the same, just without the... Uh, the as much a catamaran structure between the central bit and the outriggers uh, we actually have the same issue which if I then put this extra engine or the, the one that I've now got that's unbalanced on the opposite toggle I can then just keep that running the whole time that I've not got my engines running to give me more power that's amazing all right so I was having trouble trying to shoot the orb weaver with my uh, with my goalkeeper there so what I needed to do was actually come over and have a look from this perspective because I just couldn't just couldn't point in the right direction. But from here, I could actually get the bullets. I think it was more from spray than anything, but I could actually get the bullets going where I wanted them to and took out any and all resistance there. I, I don't know why I could shoot at it, but it couldn't shoot at me other than the fact that all the guns were pointed upwards. So I think that might have something to do with it there. But there we go. I think this is actually... Ben Bay totally conquered. Yay, glories to Lida. The only thing left to do to solidify Lida's victory here is to drive over and find ourselves somewhere nice to park. Obviously, Ben Bay does have the whole falling through the floor issue to worry about here. But once we park up, we get out, we put down a flag, we claim this place as Lida's home and go, yeah, Clothulian Peninsula. It belongs to Clothu. What you gonna do about it? So despite the masses of destruction and the many missions that we've already put on uh, up until this point, those of you that have been paying attention will note that I had done a tank and I'd done a helicopter, leaving me one air launch left. Now, I could have taken this air launch and gone and rained destruction down on the allied forces of T, but I was like, no, no, I've, I've done well. I've taken two bases over myself, one that was originally mine and one that uh, was my actual takeover. 
It's time for us to go up to the moon and my dear, dear ally penguin has already gone up and shown us the way to the rich vein ores, has found a nice crater for us to cohabit and has even invited me to come live in his hole. As an upstanding gentleman and a member on the international stage, I would find it very rude if I was to uh, rebuke his invitation. So, of course, I am going to do the same. Uh, so, this ve vessel here is absolutely massive. You can see the Kerberdyne system in the middle there. That is a scaled up Kerberdyne system. The tanks that I had on the outside of this rocket when we took off, they might have looked like small tanks, but they were full sized orange tanks. So, just to give you guys the scale of what I'm launching here. As a long-term player of Kerbal Space Program, getting to the moon, not the hardest thing on my list of achievements that I have done. So what we're going to do is we're going to push ourselves up into about 100 kilometer Apple apps. We're then going to sling it sideways and go as fast as we can until our peri apps just about matches that. We're then going to find out where the moon is and, of course, try and put ourselves a maneuver node in to make ourselves have a nice close encounter with the moon's sphere of influence. Throw off! those fairings to show you the scale of the building that I have inside. You see that uh, sideways module at the top there? That is a science lab. Just to, again, give the idea of the scale of what we're doing here. A small burn, a few manoeuvres, and a bit of time later, we find ourselves ma matching our periaps up with Penguin's base already on the moon. Br dropping our way down to make this uh, circularization burn to just make sure we stay within the moon sphere of influence. All pretty standard stuff that I'm sure you have seen before. Leading us to this point where we are coming down low over the crater and are ready to make our final braking maneuver so that we can get down and try and make a nice safe landing here because, you know, this is quite a large vessel. I've not landed at anything this large on the moon for quite some time. Indeed, most of everything that I've done recently has just been fighting on Kerbin. So there is plenty of room for things to go wrong here. Mainly the timing. We've got to try and get this timing right. I can't figure out where the wall of the crater is from this point of view. I think it's that ridge of rock in front of me. But as we go over it, I'm like, what well, is it? Is that dark bit down there the dark bit of the crater? I don't know. We'll just have to try and make do with what we've got. Trying to separate the rocket from my from my base here actually gave me uh, a bit more spin than I was looking to get. Gave me a bit of momentum in the wrong direction. It was nothing really that I couldn't like correct for, but it was just a little bit of hassle that I, I didn't want at that point in time. Uh, I noticed that the Kerbidine engine on the bottom here was far too powerful for the size of vessel I've got, and I had also noticed we were coming down towards a slope. Not the best situation to find myself in. But more than dealable, as long as the vessel doesn't change the place that it's being controlled from, which is what happened there to make me spin out. But we made down a nice little landing here. So now we're just going to fold out all the science and drilling and etc. modules, make sure this whole place is a workable base. And I'm going to say thank you very much for joining me for this Kerbal Collaborative Warfare. I will see you next time when we're going to deal with whatever it is the Alliance of Tape and, and Agon Arch decide to bring towards us. And I will see you then when we're going to do that. Glory's to leader! Bye!